this is culture in psychology this is for issues and debates um, and there's several key terms that you need to know about for this area um, here's here are the first few cultural bias um, which you've come across before uh, this is the idea that you ignore cultural differences, you develop laws that apply to everyone after researching just in one culture, so your your work has cultural bias. Um, ethnocentrism closely related, where you view your own culture as normal and use your culture to judge other cultures. So they you don't they don't necessarily become abnormal, but you, you still consider your, your values are still centred around your own culture, which you view as normal. Um, cultural relativism, um, this is the idea where you consider the behaviour of an individual within their culture before making any judgments, that norms can only be meaningful and make sense within their cultural context. Um, so that's your first few key terms. Then we've got universality. This is the idea that where you assume you can generalise your findings globally because humans are all fundamentally alike um, and this is a search that is right at the root of psychology where you're searching for universal principles of behaviour but you can only find those principles if you adopt a non-ethnocentric approach because otherwise you're going to have cultural bias in your research and make conclusions that aren't valid. Um, and there's two things, two concepts here that are really important, emic and etic. So etic is a concept that's culturally, ch blah, 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 culturally general. So for example, raising responsible children is a concept that spans across cultures. It's a general concept. Um, and an etic approach would study behaviour from outside a cultural system. It might conduct research in many cultures to find universal laws. An emic approach, on the other hand, is a concept that's cultural, culturally specific. So if you look at uh, encouraging independent thinking compared to raising responsible children, you can see how that's much more culturally specific. Not every culture will believe that encouraging independent thinking in children is a good thing. Um, an, an emic approach would study behaviour from inside a cultural system to understand it. So you have indigenous psychologists from that culture studying their own culture in order to understand behaviour. So it's culturally specific versus culturally general, or if you want to think of it in terms of being inside the culture and being outside the culture. Um, and then how this works, so if you use your own research to study your own research tool to study your own culture, that would be called an emic approach. But if you then use the same research tool to study another culture and assume that's a valid way to compare it, that would be called an imposed etic because you're imposing a culturally specific research tool onto another culture to make generalizations about um, human behavior, about universal laws of psychology and so on. So you'd be making the false assumption in this situation um, that the situation you're studying has the same meaning for the members of the new culture as it did for the original culture. Okay, so those are the key issues that you need to know about for your description. Let's think about evaluation. So first of all, we've got issues where, where you're comparing cultures to start with. Even if you're using a really carefully considered approach, let's imagine that you set research up really carefully so that you've got um, an indigenous psychologists conducting their own research and then bringing it all together for some kind of comparison. Even doing that, we could have um, various issues. So if we're comparing cultures in order to find these universals of behaviour, what we can do is lose track of diversity within cultures. So what I mean by this is one country can contain many, many different subcultures. Um, and I'm sure most of you are probably aware of this. Thinking about the difference between subgroups even within our country culture in within our country sorry so the differences found between countries might also be found between subcultures within those countries um, 
so many cultures have large popula many countries sorry have large populations of people that come from other countries within them or large populations of people uh, if you think about religious distinctions and so on from the same country but very different beliefs and attitudes and so on um, so a couple of examples uh, might be uh, conflicts between Sunni and Shia Muslims in the Middle East or Catholic and Protestant Christians in Northern Ireland. Um, there's many different really, uh, those are really um, obvious big examples, but there's many different more subtle subgroups that aren't united in opinion, behaviour, values and so on um, within a country. So if you're comparing countries, it implies that each cult country you're comparing is kind of one entity it's united but the opposite may really well be true and you may find that if you draw a conclusion saying country a has this approach whereas country b has this approach you might have needed to have looked closer at country b and found that actually there was a massive subgroup in country b that you didn't include that had the same um opinions as country a so um that's why you have to be really careful with cultural comparison with comparing countries and just be aware of the subtlety and the subgroups that are that are there um, and then uh, I suppose one question you can ask in evaluation is it really important to understand cultural bias we probably know the answer to this one already but here's an example of some questions which were asked on the US Army IQ test which was used just before World War One um, if you're not American you probably would have trouble answering some of that um, it equally you know even if you know what's missing from the tennis racket picture um, you know there may there would be groups who wouldn't know that so the results of this test were the top IQ was white Americans just below that was European immigrants African Americans were at the very bottom of the scale with the lowest mental age as a result of the cultural bias in this IQ test Clearly, that's not a reflection of reality. But this data had a massive effect on the attitudes held by Americans towards black people and those from Southern Eastern Europe, and it led to loads of stereotypes and prejudice, which was all really badly, really ill-founded. Um, so that's why it's really important to understand and recognise and be aware of cultural bias in research that we're conducting. So that's one point to say that this is a really important issue. Um, but it might be reducing now. So we're obviously in a, a bit of an age of globalisation. Um, and one of the distinctions that's often drawn between cultures is that w um, in the West, we're what's an, called an individualist culture, where we're kind of really strong on the individual. What, what are your personal choices? Your you know you must succeed and all of that collectivist cultures place far more importance on um, the family and the group and um, the whole group being responsible for things and so on and one um, one study had a look at comparing the US and Japan which is thought of as a collectivist culture traditionally and actually in that study they found no evidence of this distinction so it may be lessening now in the age of globalisation and also psychologists are now able to meet at global conferences where many many different countries come together and discuss their research and share ideas and so on and all of that ought to reduce ethnocentrism in psychology significantly we should be able to be far more aware of cultural issues and avoid having really bad cultural bias within our research um, and then the last question is if if cultural bias is really important to avoid do we end up in this situation where actually all research is culturally specific so there's no point even looking for these universal laws of behavior um, and the answer to that question is really we shouldn't overemphasize this problem because it's still possible to find universal laws um, that there's two studies here. Ekman um, found that basic facial expressions for emotions are the same all over the world. Interactional synchrony is universal. So there certainly are universal laws, but the way not to find them is through culturally biased research. The way to do it is to um, involve the search for universal laws as well as the study of variations between individuals and groups. So that's why it's important to have an awareness of all of these factors in, in cultural bias.
and there are loads of advantages of cross-cultural research. It can highlight assumptions made about the original culture that hadn't been spotted. So if you give an intelligence test that assumes that if you're intelligent, you can think in if you're intelligent, you can think quickly, whereas another culture might value kind of slow, thoughtful thinking as a sign of intelligence. Um, also, cross-cultural research can show the effect of context on the individual. Often in research we think, oh, that's um, the individual's choice to behave in that way, or that's their personality that's causing it. And we, put, make, we almost have a dispositional explanation. We, we think it's to do with that person, the way they're behaving. Whereas actually, um, doing cross-cultural research can give us far more awareness of the context and how the context of the research is influencing the behaviour of the original. So it can give us a much more uh, complex understanding of the interplay of those different factors. So it's really important to do cross-cultural research, rather than avoiding it because it will have pitfalls or whatever. Um, it's still really important to be carrying out cross-cultural research for those reasons.